Greetings one and all, Super Tuesdays here in the Holy Land, the Holy Apple, the Holy Hilltop, Tal Bin Yamin. Seventh day of Adar 5783. Uh, this will be our offering for this Purim this year. The title of this class is called <clears throat> Hooray! Purim. Finally, a holiday without the land of Israel. Oh, really? Once again, Purim, hooray! Finally, a holiday without the land of Israel. Oh, really? Question mark. Okay. We have the three major holidays in the Jewish calendar here, Passover, uh, Shavuot, and Sukkot. Those are the three major holidays, and we have a commandment to go up to do a, to perform a pilgrimage uh, up to the uh, temple in Jerusalem three times a year, three times a year. It's very important for us to understand that every holiday has three legs to it, foundation. Number one is an historical event that occurred. Passover, of course, uh, being freed of slave, slavery. Shavuot, receiving the Torah. Uh, Sukkot, 40 years, miraculously surviving the conditions, the impossible conditions of a nation living in a desert. So that's one leg of the holiday. Second leg is the uh, is the agriculture leg represented in the land of Israel. This is the second foundation of every Jewish holiday. There is an agricultural aspect to the holiday. The third leg and final leg that the holidays uh, stand on is the seasons of the year. Notice that uh, Passover is the end of winter, beginning of spring. We have a change in the season. Shavuot is the leaving spring going into the summer. And we have Sukkot leaving the summer, entering the fall. There are changes with seasonal changes which are happening. So once again, to summarize, every Jewish holiday stands on one of three, on three legs. A historical event, agricultural event that's happening at that time in the land of Israel, and a seasonal change that is happening in the land of Israel. If we, what we will do now with God's help is take a look at the verses the Torah mentions when they speak about the three pilgrimages to Jerusalem and to the temple. What are they talking about? We will be shocked. Many of us will be shocked. Because let's put the cards on the table. Unfortunately, because of the fact that we have not been in the land of Israel for 2,000 years, We've lost the, most of the legs of the holiday, we've lost. We've lost the agricultural aspect of the holiday. We've lost the seasonal aspect of the holiday. What is left is that historical event that has happened. That is all we have to hold on to. And that is, unfortunately, one leg. If you're standing on one leg instead of three legs, so we are crippled. So I'm going to translate quickly. I've organized the holidays here. I'm bringing the verses on each holiday, and you will be amazed what is the subject matter of the holiday. Is it the historical event that is being stressed here? or something else. Okay, so let's take it from the top. In 
the book of Exodus, chapter 12, verses 23 to 26. It talks about how God passed over the Jewish homes, and the Jewish people were not, uh, were not harmed on that night of Passover when the Jewish people left. And then it says, when you come to the land of Israel that I will give you, remember this, these, this service of Passover. What? What does the land of Israel have to do with Passover? I mean, Passover was in Egypt, and then we left and we went to the desert. What is the connection here? When you enter the land. Yeah, that's what it says. Okay, next. Exodus chapter 13, verses 4 to 6. Today you have left uh, the land of Egypt in the month of spring. When you come, when God will bring you into the land of Israel, lands of the seven nations that I have promised your forefathers to give you a land of flowing with milk and honey, you will observe these commandments of Passover. Seven days you shall eat the un, uh, the un, the uh, unleavened, leavened bread. Unleavened. Okay. Next. Uh, Exodus chapter twenty-three, verses fifteen and sixteen. Three times a year you shall go up and celebrate the holidays. The, uh, the holiday of matzot, you shall keep for seven days, you shall eat the matzah, as I have uh, commanded you in the month of the spring that you have left Egypt. Second time, we refer to the seasonal time of the year. So, so far when we talk about the holidays, we're talking about the land of Israel, twice is mentioned, and twice the seasonal changes. Exodus, chapter 34, verses 18 and 19. The holiday of Passover you shall keep. Seven days you shall eat the matzah, like God has commanded you, in the month of the spring. Because in the month of the spring you have left Egypt. Three, four, this is the fourth time that the month is an important part of the holiday. Leviticus chapter 23, verses 10 and 11. When I will bring you to the land of Israel, and you will cut down the first harvest of barley. You will bring a certain amount, it's called Omer, the beginning of the harvest to the priest. And then they will shake it in a certain way. They will take the barley offering. This is on the second day of Passover. It was brought to the temple and the priest would shake it, uh, you know, shake, 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 shake your barley. Shake your barley, Ken. Okay. And then we continue uh, in Leviticus. And you will count from the second day of Passover seven weeks. Thus connecting, very interesting, what are you connecting? Notice it doesn't say connecting uh, leaving Egypt to receiving the Torah. It says we're going to connect two harvests. One, the harvest of the barley, which is on the second day of Passover. And then, seven weeks later, 49 days later, we have the harvest of the wheat. All, of course, Israel time, the land of Israel time. Because the only crop that is ready, grains that are ready during Passover, is the barley. The wheat comes only at the time of the holiday of Shavuot. So this is the counting of the Omer, connecting two harvests. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 1. 
guard the month of spring, and you shall make the Passover holiday to God. Because in the in this spring month, God brought you out of the land of Egypt. So we have six times, six times that God stresses to us that the spring is an important issue here. And five times God stresses to us we, the importance of the agricultural side of the holidays. Next, the holiday of Shavuot. It says in Exodus chapter 23 verse 19, the beginning fruits, harvest of the fruits, you shall bring to the house of God. At the time of Shavuot, there were two, uh, two harvests that were brought to the temple. Number one, the wheat. The first uh, harvest of the wheat was brought to the temple, and the wheat was turned into two loaves of bread. And the, also the first fruits, the seven species that the land of Israel is blessed with, they are brought also to the temple. The first fruits, which happen to become ripe at the beginning, the end of the spring, the beginning of the summer. Exodus chapter 34, continuing on the holiday of Shavuot, verse, 20, uh, verse 22. You shall, shall make a holiday called Shavuot at the time where you are harvesting the wheat. Once again, Shavuot, no mention of receiving the Torah. It's the time of the harvest of the wheat. Leviticus chapter 23, verses 16 and 17. At the end of 49 days from Passover to Shavuot, you shall bring a new, you shall bring a new grain offering to the temple. From the land of Israel you shall bring a, a two bread, two loaf offering and bring it to the temple. That was the major main service during the month, during the holiday of Shavuot. Once again no mention of the receiving of the Torah. Continuing, Leviticus uh, chapter 23, but now we're on verse 2. When you, when you cut the, and harvest your fields from the wheat, you should not forget the poor and the desperate and the converts. Numbers chapter 28, verse 26. And on the holiday of the Bikurim, Bikurim are the first fruits of the seven species that the land of Israel was blessed. When you bring a new grain offering of wheat on the holiday of Shavuot, you are not allowed to do work. It is like the Sabbath. Sukkot, now the holiday of Sukkot. The holiday of Sukkot is called, in the Torah, it's called Chag Asif, when we gather from the fields. In the land of Israel, it does not rain for four months or so, uh, the spring and uh, the end of the spring and summer months, it does not rain in the land of Israel. They used to keep the produce that they picked outside to, uh, to uh, bask in the sun and to finish its ripening process. So it's called the holiday is called the holiday of the uh, gathering up the uh, fruits and the grains from the field because the time of Sukkot is the time where it begins the rainy season in the land of Israel and water will destroy the fruits and the crops. So there, that's why Sukkot is called the holiday of the ingathering of the crops and the fruits. Next. That was, excuse me, that was uh, Exodus chapter 34, uh, verses 22 and 23. Now we're in Leviticus chapter 23, uh, verses 39 
to 41. Very interesting. It says on the 15th day of the month, uh, the seventh month of the year, Tishrei, when you gather up the, uh, all the grains and the fruits in your field, this will be a holiday of seven days. Uh, first day is like the Sabbath, no work. The eighth day is also considered to be a Sabbath. And then it says that you will take the four special species that we take on the holiday of Sukkot. Now this is very interesting because uh, unlike what most of us think, in the, in the desert the Jewish people did not celebrate Sukkot. They were living in Sukkot. They didn't have to celebrate it. It's only when you came into the land of Israel. In fact, Maimonides says in the Guide to Perplexed, chapter 43, the second volume, chapter 43, he says the whole reason why we celebrate the holiday of Sukkot is to see the great gifts that, are, that God has given us by the fact that we have these four species that are growing, something that we never had in the desert. None of these things grew, but this is special for the land of Israel. So, ironically, amazingly, I mean, we should all be shocked here. The three major pilgrimages to Jerusalem and to the Temple Mount, we quoted a lot of verses here. They're talking about either, either the seasonal change of the year that this happens, or the agriculture side of the holiday. No mention here about the historical leg of the holiday. Now, after reading these verses, we can understand the Talmud, Tractate, Psachim, page 8, side B. An amazing idea. There is an opinion in the Talmud that a person that does not have land in the land of Israel, does not own land in the land of Israel, is exempt from coming up three times a year. That includes Passover. That is an amazing idea. Why is that? Who, what is the connection? We, after 2,000 years of not being, of being disconnected to the land of Israel, we see that we've really become, uh, we have become divorced from the agriculture aspect, the land of Israel, and we are left hanging, literally by a fingernail, of the historical event of that time. We didn't have a choice. We were exiled from our land. We were expelled from the land of Israel. Got it. Okay, but now, in the last 75 years, this is coming, these foundations, the seasonal, and the agricultural foundations are, have returned. Amazing. God has returned us to the special aspects of the agriculture and the seasonal time of year. So therefore, if you do not have land, you're exempt. What's your connection to the three major holidays? If you do not have land in the land of Israel, that is an amazing idea. Further, it is brought down in the tractate of Yivamot, <clears throat> page 63b. A person that does not have land, a Jew that does not have land, is not considered to be a person. <laughs> Say what? For 2,000 years, we didn't have land. We didn't have our land. And Rav Cook says that is why it is so difficult when we're coming back after 2,000 years of being being separated from agriculture, from the land. So this has really destroyed us. We're not even considered to be, to be human beings. That's what it says. A person that does not have land is not considered to be a person. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. Why? Why are we called people? Now we have to revert here to Hebrew. 
In Hebrew, a person is a man is called Adam. And it says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, that why are we called Adam? Because we were taken from the Adama. Listen closely. Adam, Adama. Same word. And there's another verse that man is called Adam. There's a verse in Isaiah, chapter 14, verse 14, where it says there, we, we, we are similar to the heavens, to the heavenly creatures, to God. The same word spelled, just the vowels are different, but Adame, the word Adama, Adame Le'elion. And now we can understand the idea. We can understand what the importance of the land of Israel is all about. The purpose of man is, first of all, to appreciate the land, to connect with the land. But the land, connecting to the land, can bring us, God forbid, down. A person could say, Oh, it's my, it's, it's my uh, intellect that has brought me these, these, this success on the land. So therefore there's a danger to it. But really, God has placed us, God has given us the land of Israel to uplift the materialism, to uplift the uh, land issues in life, and bringing up them closer to the heavenly bodies. That is the whole purpose. Using, utilizing the land of Israel to help us elevate ourselves spiritually through the materialism, but uplifting in it. That is the whole purpose. And therefore, there is such a tremendous two legs out of three of each Jewish holiday, pilgrimages to Jerusalem and to the temple, they include produce on the land of Israel. People are working hours and working hard, and they include the seasonal changes that are happening in order for us to bring it all up. When we look at the seasons of the, of the holidays, we understand what God wants from us. Well, spring, the Jewish people were almost dead in Egypt. No one believed that they would ever be able to escape. And then we're able to leave. That is exactly the spring of the world. That is the spring of the Jewish nation. We looked dead. When you look at a tree now, most of the trees look dead, as we're now at the end of the winter. But very, very shortly, in the next couple of weeks, everything will change. And that is exactly what's happening spiritually. Uplifting ourselves to be like the seasonal change. We could always change. And when it comes to summer, when we have the holiday of Shavuot, well, now everything is ripe. How are, what about our deeds? What about our speech? It is to awaken us. The connection that a Jew has to the land of Israel and to the seasonal change and to the agricultural aspects of the land of Israel is to connect us to the spiritual. But without the agriculture, without the seasonal changes of the land of Israel, we're fighting a losing battle. We're fighting a losing battle. We're just, we're barely holding on one nail here. And when the time of Sukkot comes, okay, it's the end of the summer, the beginning of the fall, rain, abundance. What about our Torah, studying, learning? It's all connected. God has given us a world, that's why Maimonides writes that if a person would just concentrate on the wonders of the world, the earth, they would come to close to God. And that's the whole idea here in the land of Israel. It says amazingly that in the desert we had the special manna bread. 
why didn't that could not continue in the land of Israel? It is not necessary in the land of Israel. By eating the produce of the land of Israel, the produce of the land of Israel is holy. It uplifts a person spiritually. Only the produce of the land of Israel. When you're eating outside the land of Israel, it's bringing you down. You ever feel tired and sleepy when you eat? It's bringing us down. But in the land of Israel, the materialism is also holy. It's a stepping stone to bring us closer to God. Now, check this amazing, continuing this idea. In the tractate of Rosh Hashanah, page 16, side 8, Rabbi Akiva comes around and says an amazing idea. Listen to what he has to say. He says the following. Why do we bring the barley offering on Passover? And he answers his own question. A good Jew asks his own question, gives his own answer. In order that God bless the new crops of grains during the new year of crops. And then Rabbi Akiva continues. Why do we bring wheat to the to the temple mount on the holiday of Shavuot in order for God to bless uh, the new season of grains and the wheat to sustain uh, the Jewish people and the world. And question number three, according to the words of the Reef and the Rosh, Rabbi Akiva says, why do we bring us on Sukkot, why do we bring water from the city of David, from the fount, from the springs of the Shiloh? And then he answers Rabbi Akiva because this is the rainy season in the land of Israel, beginning, and therefore, so God should bless us with a tremendous uh, blessing of a rainy, uh, productive year that's coming up. So. All these three issues, the barley on Passover, the wheat on Shavuot, the water, these are all produce from the land of Israel. We don't bring wheat from, uh, from the Ukraine. We bring wheat from the land of Israel. We don't bring barley from outside the land of Israel. That's the law. We bring it from the land of Israel. We bring water from the land of Israel. That is the law. In order to bless the coming year. That's an amazing thing. That is an amazing idea. Rabbi Akiva is, is telling us. He's going over the three holidays. He's not talking about leaving Egypt. He's talking about agriculture and connecting it to the holiday of Passover. He's talking about agriculture and connecting it to the, la to the holiday of Shavuot, connecting water, rain, to the holiday of Sukkot. Amazing! Rabbi Avram Yitzchak Sorotskin in his book, commentar Commentary on the Talmud, in his book called Gvurat Yitzchak, page 112, tells us an amazing idea. Gives us an amazing idea. The idea is that <coughs> Rabbi Akiva, if he, Rabbi Akiva, what's his question really? We know that the time of Passover is a time uh, where we bring the new barley and there, therefore from that time on we could enjoy the new crops, what's called Chadash. And we know that on the time of Shavuot, when Shavuot comes and we bring up the two loaves, the wheat offering. We know that this allows us to bring offerings to the temple from the new grains. So we have two periods of time. So what's Rabbi Akiva answer? We know, we know what the law is. He says an amazing idea, no. To teach us a lesson, Rabbi Akiva is coming along, he knows that there's technical issues, that at the time of Passover we can enjoy, people can enjoy the new crops. We know that at the time of Shavuot we can bring from the new crops to offerings to the temple. Okay, got it. 
That's a technical issue. But more so, Rabbi Akiva is coming to tell us that there is an intrins a intrinsic connection between Passover and the barley, between Shavuot and the wheat, between water and the holiday of Sukkot. That is amazing, something we would never dream of. There's some kind of intrinsic value of wheat, of the agriculture side of these holidays, we forgot because of 2,000 years of being stripped of the land of Israel. Uh, Rabbi Dessler writes in Yichtab Eliyahu on Purim, page 124, the commandment to bring the barley is extremely a very, very deep commandment. Uh, <clears throat> many, many times the Talmud tells us in Tractate Megillah 16a that the redemption was brought to the Jewish people through the merit of the barley offering. Rabbi Dessler explains the Omer represents, why is it so great? Why, was, why did God give us redemption? Because of bringing a barley offer, offering to the temple on Passover. Why don't we get redemption because of talking about the story of Passover? Tells an amazing thing. The idea of the barley, its importance is seeing God within nature. What is the land of Israel? Now we can understand the whole raison d'etre of the land of Israel is seeing God through a material land. And that's the idea behind the three pilgrimages to go up to the land and to bring produce. And it's connected. Two of the three legs are connected to the agricultural side, to the seasonal side. And it is to see that the produce that we've had and all our toil and hard work, it is really God. God is giving us the blessing, not our strength and knowledge and keenness. And now we can also understand when the Talmud in two places uh, <clears throat> tells us one in Megillah, page 17, and the other in um, Sanhedrin, page 97, it tells us in two of those places, the clearest sign of redemption of the Jewish people is when the land of Israel begins once again to give off its fruits and produce in a nice fashion. What? Tell me about spirituality. Tell me about uh, people keeping Shabbos. What the clearest sign of redemption is when the land begins to give off its produce? What does that have to do with Judaism? Ho, ho, ho. It's the, the whole idea of the land of Israel is uplifting the materialism to connect it to spirituality. When you live and you breathe in and you walk the land of Israel, it's bringing us up spiritually. It's bringing us closer to God. That is the whole idea that Rob Dessler is bringing down here. And that's why Rob Dessler himself said in the fourth book, fourth volume, he says what took him years to understand spiritual concepts, what took him years to understand outside the land of Israel, took him a couple of weeks in the land of Israel. That is the idea. Seeing God within nature. That is why there was no reason for us in Eretz Yisrael, in the land of Israel, to receive the manna bread, which was miraculous. Here in Israel, by eating the food, the produce, it is spiritually uplifting all of us. It is bringing us closer to God. We don't need the miraculous. Here in the land of Israel, we see God through the lenses of nature, through the lenses of the Holy Land. Okay, now, the title of our class, of course, was Hip Hip Hooray. Finally, Purim, finally a holiday not connected to the land of Israel. We've shown over and over again, the last half hour, how the major three holidays, pilgrimages up to the temple, are connected, the foundations of these holidays are the is the agriculture and the seasonal changes of the land of Israel. 
Everything goes according to the agriculture and the seasons of Israel. So, is this so? Is this true? How far from the truth this is. So let's delve into it and we're going to try to go as fast as we can because we have only this time before Purim, so we got to get it going. Okay. Nothing could be further from the truth. Purim is also a holiday which is connected to the land of Israel. What? Say what? It happened in Persia. Yes, it did happen in Persia, not the land of Israel. True, but let's see. We have to, number one, understand the whole the whole scenario, the whole behind the scenes of the story of Purim revolves around the land of Israel and the temple. Once again, you heard it correctly. The entire story of Purim revolves around the land of Israel and the temple. either the building or the destruction. Everything. According to the Gentiles, they were celebrating. They were celebrating, according to their calculations, the Jewish people were in exile after the Babylonian uh, King Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple, the first temple. We were in exile for 70 years. According to the calculations of Hashverosh, 70 years had passed. Jewish people were not back in the land of Israel. Majority of the Jews were not back in the land of Israel whatsoever. The temple was in ruins. And therefore, he throws this entire party of six month party. You know, I know that people like partying, but six months, that's heavy. So, the party is no longer is there a temple for the Jewish people. No longer is there a chance of redemption of the land of Israel. That is the message of Purim. So let's take it step by step. After the party of Hashverosh that we mentioned for six months and one week in the, uh, in the town of, in, the, uh, uh, in Shushan, it says in our, our sages, Esther Rabbah, the beginning of chapter 2, during the party of Achashverosh, Achashverosh brought foods that were reminiscent of the land of Israel, which means they were foods from Persia, but they reminded the Jewish people of these were foods that were from the land of Israel. Like, you could be in Israel and you could eat like hot dog and mustard. It brings you back or french fries brings you back to the old country to America but of course the produce is from from Israel so what was his point our sages tell us what was his point of bringing food of Eretz Israel he's telling the Jewish people listen there is no more land of Israel finito la cameria no more land of Israel don't worry about it we will give you foods outside the land of Israel, as if you'll feel like you're in Israel. I remember growing up in the States, there were these me and me falafel, you know, like, okay, we have to feel at home, so we're going to sell these falafel, unkosher falafels, me and me. I don't know if that chain still exists. Let me know in the comment section. <laughs> yeah. So he's rubbing it in to the Jewish people. Don't worry. You know, Williamsburg, Borough Park, it's all like the land of Israel. There's no real difference. Number three, it says three times that Mordechai was, the Jewish hero, was exiled from the land of Israel. Why is that? The Gra points out that this shows that Mordechai was a man who loved the land of Israel. Even though he was forced, forcibly exiled from the land of Israel, time in and time again he came back. He was exiled once, came back. Twice, came back. Three times he was exiled from the land of Israel to back to uh, outside the land of Israel. Mordechai, a man who loves the land of Israel. 
Why was the princess Vashti killed? So, in the, uh, in the Midrash Abba Guryon, on, uh, on the first chapter of Esther, it says that she was killed because her mission was to make sure that Achashverosh would not build the temple, not give permission to build the temple for the Jewish people. Amazing. That is why she was killed. She is trying to stop uh, the green light being given by her husband to rebuild the temple. Next question. Why were there, there were seven officers who were asked to give their advice to, after Vashti refused to come out naked, they were asked to give uh, their advice. After they give their advice, we don't see them any longer in, uh, in the uh, scrolls of Esther. Their advice was to kill the, the princess Vashti. That is the, uh, once again, the Midrash Abu, Abba Gurion says, because of the fact that these seven people, they were the major advisors to King Ahasuerus not to continue the building of the temple. Next. Um, <clears throat> why does Haman appear after the attempted uh, coup of Bigtan and Teresh and saved by Mordechai? Okay. So the Esther, chapter 3, paragraph 1, Achashverosh knew that he owed Mordechai a favor for saving his life. He also knew that Mordechai would ask, as a favor, ask for the permission to rebuild the temple. Achashverosh would allow Mordechai to build the temple, knowing that he, if he inaugurated Haman, he would destroy it. It was a win-win situation. Amazing. So once again, we ask the question, why does Haman appear after Mordechai saves King Ahasuerosh from this, uh, uh, from this coup by Biktan Viteresh? Why does he, why does he save Ahasuerosh? He saves him because he believed that Ahasuerosh would give permission to rebuild the temple. However, Ahasuerus was well aware of this and therefore he made sure at the same time that Mordechai saved him and would ask a favor to build the temple to appoint Haman as a minister in his government in order to make sure that he would be seen as a good guy. He would be a good guy towards Mordechai and allow them to build the temple and he was a good guy towards Haman allowing him to destroy the temple so once again revolving around this behind the scenes of the story of Esther the story of the Jewish people of Purim is the land of, e the land of Israel is the temple moving along uh, by the way, why did the, what we just mentioned, that Mordechai saved a wicked King Ahasuerus because he believed that even though he's wicked, he was the one that would allow the building of the temple. This could be found in, if found in Yalkut Shimoni, paragraph 1053. Ahasuerus keeps on telling Esther he's willing to give up half of his kingdom. Talmud teaches us that the deep understanding of Ahasuerosh was that if the temple would be erected, that would be the end of his kingdom because it's either the Jewish kingdom or the kingdom of the nations. They don't, they don't uh, fuse together. It's either or. So, uh, therefore he understood that he would continue refusing to build the temple because the building of the temple would be the end of his reign, end of his monarchy. Why were the ten sons of Haman killed? They were not involved in his father's plot. 
according to the book Seder Olam, which was written by the Tana, Rabbi Yossi, the son of Chalafta, on page 452, they were the ones, these ten were the ones that came to the king of Cyprus, Korish, and who had given the green light to rebuild the temple, the second temple, and he persuaded these ten wicked sons of Haman, persuaded him to stop the building of the temple, which the building of the temple had stopped for 18 years during uh, the time of Korish, and then later on in the time of Achashverosh, for 18 years it was stopped. Once again, the whole story of Purim revolves around about the land of Israel, land of Israel and the temple. Next, the son of Esther and Hashverosh, they had a Jewish son, of course Esther is Jewish, this child is Jewish, Daryavish uh, II, he was the one that renewed the rebuilding of the second temple. Once again, the story of Purim story is the story of rebuilding the temple, returning to the land of Israel. <clears throat> when Mordechai heard the decree that the Jewish people would be annihilated 11 months later in the month of Adar. He gathers up the children and he learns with them the, the laws. This was in the month of Nisan, the month of Passover. He learns with them the laws of the Omer, of the barley offering. What is he doing? Why doesn't he, why doesn't he learn, uh, maybe pray, maybe uh, learn the laws of, of believing in Hashem, Emunah, along of trusting in God. There's a lot of things that could be learned at the time. <coughs> Mordechai understood that the whole ball game, this whole story of Purim and the, all of these decrees against the Jewish people, they all revolve around the land of Israel and the temple. And therefore, there was a uh, there was a need to stress this to the students and therefore that was the subject the subject was we now even though we are we are facing annihilation we must realize that the key to our success the key to annulling this decree is the land of Israel and is the temple mount now there's an amazing Nachmanides, amazing. He asks the question, this is the beginning of Tractate Megillah, Nachmanides. Why was Purim established as a holiday for two different days? We know that Haman had this sentence he came, he had like a phrase that he had coined against the Jewish people, that the Jewish people were dispersed and divided. They were very uh, <clears throat> divisive people. So what's more divisive than having certain Jews celebrate this day and other Jews celebrating another day? Why wasn't Purim made just so all of us could join together and, and fix the coin phrase of Haman, who looked at the Jewish people as a very divisive people. People that were the inner fighting that was going on. This should be a uni unity holiday. Why is that? So, Nachmanes explains that amazing thing. That during the Purim era, folks, clean your ears out. This, we're going for a ride here. Put on that seatbelt. During the story of Purim, the majority of Jews that were threatened, that were alive at the time, lived in the land of Israel. Amazing! Hip hip hooray! Finally Purim, a holiday disconnected from the land of Israel. Leave us alone! Leave us alone in our little communities, in our Kiryas Yoel in London, Gateshead, leave us alone, finally a holiday we could celebrate, a holiday of the exile, <laughs> what, Nachmanides, this is a holiday of the land of Israel, because 
most of the people that were under the threat of annihilation were the Jews of the land of Israel. Don't forget, Achashverosh ruled over 127 countries. He ruled over the land of Israel. So you got it. Purim, the holiday of the land of Israel, where there was a scare that the Jews of the land of Israel, most, most of the Jews lived in the land of Israel, they would be annihilated. This is the story of the land of Israel. This is the holiday of the land of Israel. So, Nachmanides goes on. The Jews, at the time of the story of Purim, they all lived in open cities. And these were dangerous, because if you were in a walled city, you weren't under any danger. You had the protection of the walls. But the Jews lived in the land of Israel. The land of Israel was destroyed by the Babylonians 70 years before that. So the Jews, at the time, the Jews, whom the majority of Jews lived in the land of Israel, they were under a threat of annihilation. So, the Nachmanidi goes on. The first year when the Jewish people fought and they were victorious, that year, the certain Jews uh, celebrated the holiday of the open city on the 14th, and other Jews who lived at that time in walled communities, they celebrated it on the 15th. However, that was only one time. From that, from the second year, after the miracle, one year later, Nachmanides tells an amazing idea. The Jews, only Jews who lived in open communities, like most of the Jews lived in the land of Israel, they were the only ones that celebrated Purim on the 14th day of Adar. That's it. Anybody that had lived in walled cities no longer celebrated just the year that it happened, the days that it happened. Only some time after that, Nachmanides tells us that Mordechai and the great assembly got together and they saw various verses that they understood that there was a need for two days. There was a need. We're not going to go into that right now. We don't have the time. That could be a separate uh, class. But they understood from the text from the holy books, that there was a need for two days. However, there was a problem. Now, there, Purim would be two days. It would be on the 14th, and it would be also on the 15th. However, Jews, okay, the Jews in the land of Israel who survived the threat of annihilation, they all lived in open cities. So the land of Israel would be celebrating on the 14th with the open cities. This would be an embarrassment because the land of Israel took pride in its walled cities, in its beautiful walled cities, the old city. People come from all over the world to see the walls of the old city. So it would be an embarrassment. It would be an embarrassment because people who lives in walled cities, people that are frightened and our sages, Mordechai and the Great Assembly, did not want it to appear that the land of Israel was a land that people were fearful. It was a land of people that were fearful. So therefore, okay, so therefore, uh, Mordechai decrees, okay, Mordechai and the Great Assembly, they decree that uh, in order in order to give back the honor to the land of Israel which was in ruins because of the destruction of the first temple and the wars that were waged by Babylonia and Nebuchadnezzar so it was in ruins and they wanted to give respect to the land of Israel bring it back to its uh, former status of beauty on one hand once again uh, certain commentaries say that this was uh, okay, that being in a walled 
uh, being in walled cities was a sign uh, of, of fear. But other commentaries say that this was a sign of beauty. So we have two opinions on that. So therefore, that is Nachmani. Nachmani say, in order to bring that there shouldn't be, there shouldn't be an understanding that the Jews of the land of Israel, okay, no longer have uh, their beautiful walled cities. So therefore, they made Purim two days, those in open cities on the 14th, and those in walled cities. But walled cities, not from the time of the story of Purim, from the time of Joshua, the first conqueror of the land of Israel. Okay, now, the, um, the Ron disagrees with Nachmanides, and he tells us that, no, the majority of Jews during the time of Purim were not in the land of Israel. We're not in the land of Israel. They were outside the land of Israel. However, that really doesn't matter. Why? Listen to this amazing, the Tashbats. The Tashbits, he says in his Questions and Answers, Volume 3, Paragraph 297. The Tashbits says an amazing thing. That even if we go according to the opinion that during the time of Purim, the majority of the Jewish people lived outside the land of Israel. It doesn't matter. Why? Because we know that there were, there were Jews in the land of Israel during the time of Purim. And therefore, listen to this. And therefore, even if, even if we go according to the opinion of the Ron, that most of the Jews were outside of Israel, it doesn't matter. The remember the, the miracle happened be, because of the Jews living in the land of Israel. There sat the Sanhedrin. This was to the the miracle happened during the time of Purim because of the tremendous level, uh, spiritual levels of the land of Israel. Now to understand this fully, this is an amazing idea that the miracle it's true the majority of Jews were outside the land of Israel but why did the miracle take place the miracle of Purim took place only because there was a represented there was a representation of Jews that lived in the land of Israel at the time of Purim and through their merit of living in the land of Israel the Jews outside were saved now this idea is brought down in Maimonides in the laws of the new month, Kiddush HaChodesh. Maimonides says, this is, this is a book. You know, when I was gone for six months, I, didn't, I was working on a uh, chapter, but it turned into a book. I, with, bless me that I'm able to write it. We understand that through Maimonides and others, the concept of the nation of Israel is only in the land of Israel. Outside, there are communities. Outside, there are Jews, individual Jews. There might be millions of them, but they're individuals. Community and the nation of Israel exist only in the land of Israel. This is what Maimonides said. And even if there is just 10 Jews in the land of Israel, we go according to the sanctification of the new month, according to those ten Jews in Israel. And there are other opinions. If there is one Jew in the land of Israel, we go and we sanctify the new month when at the times where the new month was sanctified. Now we have a calendar. It, 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 it goes automatically. It's nothing to do with the sanctification of the, the, the new moon. However, this is an amazing idea, and that is exactly what we're talking about. This is the Tashbetz. Tashbetz says, Ron, I'll give it to you. He tells the commentator, the Ron, I'll give it to you. The majority of Jews right, were outside the land of Israel. That is true. But why did the miracle happen to the Jews outside the land of Israel? Only because there was a Jewish presence in the land of Israel. Because the Jewish people exist, the nation of Israel the nation of Israel exists only in the land of Israel. Jewish people, okay, 
Jews outside the land of Israel exist, many of them, unfortunately. Nation, community, only in the land of Israel. And therefore, whether you go according to Nachmanides, that the majority of the Jews during the Purim story who were under uh, threat of annihilation lived in the land of Israel, therefore the whole story of Purim is the story of the land of Israel, or you go according to the Ron that there was, rep, there was a minority of Jews that lived in the land of Israel, it doesn't matter. The miracle of Purim, the story of Purim, all revolves around the land of Israel and the temple and in the merit of the land of Israel, the Jewish people were saved all over the kingdoms of Achashverosh. Have a great Purim.